Exodus chapter 9 tonight, Exodus chapter 9, and we are uh, at plague number 5 in this study, and I know these are, these are themes that uh, we have discussed with our children in our Bible classes, and there's nothing new about this study, and even those who uh, are nominally Christians, those who don't go to church very much, nearly everybody in the world who knows anything about the Bible knows about these chapters in the book of Exodus. They know about the ten plagues. And it's not a small wonder that the, uh, the modern so-called scientist or uh, Bible critic goes to great lengths to discredit uh, the, the history of the book of Exodus. Uh, this message is one that is designed by our God to, to grow our faith, to convince us that uh, our God is like no other. There is no other God but our Creator. Here in Exodus, He's called Jehovah. In our later English translations, they, they stay with the word LORD in all caps following the tradition of the King James Bible. And there's not really anything wrong with that except that it does not quite translate. Uh, it, it, uh, I think it weakens a little bit the idea of the message here. The message is that that uh, Jehovah God, the, the great I Am, of chapter 3 and verse 14, this, this is our Creator who has chosen uh, a people. We learn about that in Genesis. He, he chose Abraham, and, and he, through Abraham, uh, made a promise that he began keeping that uh, he would create a great nation and that he would give them the land of Canaan. But the book of Genesis ends with them as slaves in Egypt. And we see how that by design, God has, has taken advantage of all the evil that brought the people of Israel into Egypt. And he's orchestrated it into a great symphony of beauty and power and glory and wonder. The majesty of God as he confronts uh, the pride of a great king of a great empire and face to face here early on in Israel's history confronts the false religion of idolatry. The problem with false religions is they always have moral consequences in the way people live their lives. And that happens over and over again throughout the Old Testament history. But it's today uh, it, it's still a major, uh, it's, it's a major issue. Um, I had the pleasure of, of going to the gospel meeting yesterday at, uh, at Oak Mountain. And uh, Brother Bob had to fill in for uh, uh, the regular speaker because he was called off in an emergency. But he did an excellent job talking about the, the evidences that God has accumulated uh, in the New Testament to support the idea that Jesus not only died on the cross, but he arose the third day. And that's the foundation of the gospel message. And the evidence is not hard to find. It's just there in, in full display. Question is, why would anybody doubt it? The final verdict on that is, just like here, people have other motives that are not reasonable. They have motives that are not rational for rejecting reality, for rejecting the morality of God. And so it's a moral question. People, uh, people have moral reasons why they don't want to believe in God. But we will be without excuse, Romans chapter 1. There will be no excuse on that day. I'd like us to see how, how God has orchestrated this, this ninth chapter of Exodus 
And I want us to not miss the power that he chose to place here. Uh, in there's, we have here three uh, plagues covered in chapter 9. We start out, the, two, the first two are, are briefly presented and then a great more detail in the third one. So the first plague is the fifth plague actually in this series. Uh, it, this is the, the plague in which the livestock of Egypt is threatened by a great plague. Now, let's go ahead and begin reading verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go in to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will fall with a very severe plague upon your livestock that are in the field, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, and the flocks. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing of all that belongs to the people of Israel shall die. And the Lord set a time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And the next day the Lord did this thing. Then all the livestock of the Egyptians died, but not one of the livestock of the people of Israel died. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, not one of the livestock of Israel was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. Now, now why, would, uh, why would God send Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh, uh, knowing that he's going to say no. Why would he send them up, up to him first? Why didn't he just go and just send the plague? What do you think? Yes, what do you think? Because they wanted them to understand, wanted to let them know that Pharaoh is not a god. He has no control in God is in control of all things. Okay. And you have to trust him in what he says. Okay. And be obedient mm -hmm. to what he tells you to do. Right. Pharaoh clearly pretended to be a god. Mm -hmm. So here you have Jehovah God mm -hmm. facing the Pharaoh God mm -hmm. face to face, not, not sneaking around, you know. Um, what else do you think might be involved here? I think maybe two things. One is he, God generally, it appears, seems to give people the opportunity to do the right thing. That's right. And, um, you know, he, he's presenting that here. And I think the second thing is, is to make sure the Pharaoh understands that this isn't just bad luck. This isn't yep. just a natural thing. What I'm about to bring about is not only natural, but it's also going to be unnatural in that it's only, you know, uh, usually a, a plague does not have intelligence, but this plague is going to know what belongs to the Egyptians and what belongs to the Israelites to right. make a distinction. Were a plague of this kind, you think, unusual? I mean, plagues in which all the cattle got sick and died? We still have those today, don't we? Uh, every now and then we hear about a, a hog farm somewhere and uh, what are they? Mad cow disease. Really Mad is. cow disease, yeah. Well, and uh, uh, what do they do when they have that? They kill. Well, they, they have to kill the whole herd, don't they? Why do they do that? To stop the infection because it will spread so fast it just get all of them. Okay, imagine this now. I, I know you remember the map of Egypt. Where does everybody live? Right along that Nile River. There's not much on either, either side, just a, just a little bit there. And then that's where they have, wherever the, the Nile River will reach, that's where they have their, their cattle and their crops and wherever they can plow and plant the, their wheat and their cotton and all that, they plant and everywhere else, they have their stockyards, OK? 
Okay? And where is Israel? They're right in the middle of it. They're right there in the, in the, in the land of Goshen. Uh, I don't think they feel the whole land of Goshen. Oh, the whole Delta area, I, you know, that, that's Egypt, you know. So you have Egypt divided. It might have been, uh, some calculations were, that their population was about equal. That there, there may have been as many Israelites as Egyptians. And what would be the chances of separating their cattle, the Egyptians, from the Israelites? That'd be pretty tricky, don't you think? How on earth were they saved when you have a plague, you know, a, a disease, King James calls it urine, I think. Uh, we don't really have much detail behind, beyond that. The, the problem with some of these words, and the reason that you have different translations of the word is that uh, this is a long dead language, the, the, the language of Hebrew. And of course, the, the language of Egyptian even dead longer than the language of Hebrew. And the words used to describe diseases and even of animals is a little bit tricky sometimes to translate because you might have one that will support, serve for several different purposes. So it's a disease. We don't know what it was. But it didn't just, freak, ju just strike the, uh, the pigs and then, no, pigs are now mentioned. <laughs> I just like to mention pigs. Uh, but there was there were cattle. What else? Sheep. Okay, there were sheep. Animals. There were camels. And there were horses. Now, let's think about that now. Uh, I like the Spanish word here is the word ganado. Ganado. It's the word uh, for gain, that which has been gained or earned. Their, their cattle, their sheep, their camels, this was their livelihood. It was, a, it was a symbol of their wealth. It's what they had gained or earned, and, and they, uh, they, they guarded it carefully. And so their horses, what would they use them for? Chariots. For warfare, for transportation, to... Uh, I think I mentioned earlier the use of the war chariot by horses began at the time of this dynasty. Okay? This is the 18th dynasty of Egypt. It is the Moses dynasty. I like that, don't you? Uh, I, I know that you're, a, a lot of your, your later archaeologists like to, like to date it, the, uh, this event 200 years later, the time of Ramses, you know why they want to do that? They don't want you to know that there was a dynasty of Moses. And I mean, the, the pharaohs, they, were, they had, I'm Moses and Tut Moses, and I know you've heard the name King Tut before. Uh, there were three or four, there were four of those, I believe, four or five maybe. Uh, but they began with the patriarch, Ah, Moses. That was his name. Or Mos, they, they didn't have an S on it. That came from the Greek, it wasn't in the Egyptian. But anyway, that, 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 that's how I think they tried to hide this reality. Now, this was the greatest dynasty in Egypt's history. Using these war horses and war chariots, they had conquered all the way up to the land of the Hittites, the Mitanni in the north, near Syria. And they had gone <coughs> south, down into the land of Nubia. And they had conquered and subjugated them. Uh, they were a powerful empire in that dynasty. The one that pertains to this one. We don't know which, which pharaoh this was, but we have a pretty good idea. It had to be either this um, Amenhotep the second, I think, uh, or it would have been the Tutmosis the third. Um, he was, he had a, he had a, uh, a reign of uh, like 30, uh, 37 years, I believe it was. One of the longest reigns in all of the, the dynasties of the, of the pharaohs of ancient Egypt. Uh, but the horses were important. The other thing they like to argue with is the camels. This can't be so, they say, because Egypt had not learned how to domesticate camels. 
They began saying this in the early 1900s. I want you to know that unbelieving, quote unquote, archaeologists or scientists for over a hundred years have been doing their best to discredit this Bible account. And they would say, first they said for a long time, Moses couldn't have written it because there was no writing in the days when Moses was supposed to have been in Egypt. It didn't even exist. And then they, looked, then they found the, uh, the uh, Stella of Hammurabi that dates all the way back to Abraham. And they said, there, there's your writing right there. And they found cuneiform tablets throughout uh, Syria, Aleppo, and many places like that. So uh, they're, they're saying that camels were not domesticated at this time. Well, in, in recent times, archaeologists have kind of hushed that up. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> we, we found the evidence. Yes, they did. Yes, they did domesticate. They found, uh, they found that camels had become quite a part of the culture of that time. They found camel bones there in the, camp, in the encampments in the Sinai Desert uh, where they had their, uh, their, uh, their mines. So uh, the evidence shows more and more this is accurate. They had all of this livestock in Egypt, and it was important to them. The camels, of course, for transportation, the horses for the war, and for pulling the, the chariots, and, and uh, the cattle. They worshiped the cattle. You ever heard of the Apis bull? Yeah. That's the Egyptian bull. And uh, the images they have of the Apis bull has a, a sun, the sun god, in between his horns. Uh, his position in the pantheon of the Egyptians was very high. That's why you find the Israelites, when they are tempted to go back to idolatry, they make a golden calf. It's not called Baal, but it is a golden calf. That's what they did in Egypt. And they had, they had several gods uh, that were presented by the image of the cow. The uh, Hathor was a female god or goddess, uh, the goddess of love and prosperity. Uh, Heset, the goddess of food and drink, is also portrayed with the image of a cow. Uh, you have Ammon, the ram, was a god. The sheep had a god, or uh, Sayus. The goats had a god. Mendes, and then I'm going to have to add, okay, Heset, Mechet, Rechet. <laughs> it's getting bad. Egyptian is not English, and we really don't know what it sounded like. So you can argue with me, it didn't sound that way, but you can't prove it. <laughs> we don't know what it sounded like. But then you had uh, Harishaf and Kehen Mu and Karate and Baneb the Jet Day. Did I get that right? Uh, these were their gods. And, and although it was difficult for me to say that, you know what? It was not difficult for the Egyptians. These were sacred words and the names of the gods, and they served them daily. It was a part of their daily life. To understand that, I know we come out of a culture that, that's not especially full of images and, and statues and such. Uh, but now, the Catholic culture, a little bit farther back, uh, I remember living in Miami, and many yards had a shrine in the front yard. <clears throat> many of the Cubans had a shrine, and, and it was well adorned, and it was elegantly presented, and there would be a, a statue of uh, their, their favorite saint, was Lazarus, <coughs> and he was the God, he was the patron, they didn't say God, they said patron saint, okay. They had their patron saints, and what would they do? Well, they would pray to those saints for protection when they're going to be traveling, or they would uh, pray to, what are we coming up with, the 14th? Saint, what? Saint Valentine's, Saint, Saint Valentine's Day. What is that? It's another patron saint of, well, like this Heset or, or Hathor, 
God is self-love, okay? You, you. The idea of praying to a saint is a, it's not that far removed from what the Egyptians did. And it's a part of their everyday life. These people who've had this religion in many countries for hundreds of years, and in the same is true in South America, they have, they have customs. It's a part of their, the fabric of their everyday life. <clears throat> Excuse me. They didn't use these, these animals for food at all. <laughs> well, uh, I don't believe they ate the bull uh, because uh, of his position. I don't know if they were vegetarians, to be honest with you. I, I don't think they were. I think they ate camels. Uh, and I, don't, I didn't run across the name of the camel god. It might, I might not have been. Know. You know, when uh, Daniel and all them were. Right. Were, well, that's right. Apparently in Babylon, when Daniel chose to be a vegetarian, he pulse, it was called. Yeah. Uh, apparently the king was offering his dainties were meat of some sort. So I don't believe they were necessarily vegetarian. Uh, in some ways, it sounds like the Hindu religion where, you know, you have the sacred cows and you don't, you yeah. don't uh, bother them or touch them. Uh, and the Egyptians, you know, the, other, the, the problem with idolatry is what? Where did it come from? From human imagination, okay? Is there any kind of an agreement among men about any religion? <laughs> there is, in the idolatrous religions of the world, every nation had their customs and their gods and they had their name and they had their mythologies. It was a huge array of different religions with a lot in common, but there was no uniformity to it. But it was a part of their everyday life. Now, here comes God, and he has what he calls laws, okay? Did the, did the pagan gods have laws? Not that I know of. Uh, is there... I know uh, that the, the kings had law, the Hammurabi had his code, but those were royal decrees. Those were not divine decrees, they were royal, they were from a king. But God came along and there is uniformity. There's law. God expects man to behave a certain way. He gives us things that generate our culture and our customs. And we may develop that, but there's a difference between our customs and the laws of God. Now, this is what the Lord is confronting here in this, this plague. As, he, as the plagues become more and more severe, he's dealing with things more and more, uh, let's say, intimate or close to the lives of everyday Egyptians to show who is the God who protects you. Who is the God who provides for you? It's Jehovah God. It's not these gods. It's a, con it's a contrast between the gods of Egypt and the only true and living God. So he says, uh, the plague would come upon the livestock, the horses, the donkeys, the camels, the herds, the flocks. But the Lord made a distinction <clears throat> Now, does that sound familiar to you? Uh, is, is, I thought our God was not a respecter of persons. Is God a respecter of persons? Now look out. Of course, Romans 2.11 says God is no respecter of persons. But, it goes on to say, but those who hear him and obey him he, he chooses, doesn't he? Now, he makes a choice. He does make a distinction. God gives respect to the prayers of a Christian that he does not give to the prayers of someone who is in rebellion against him. Sam? You know, it goes on in Romans 2 to, you know, answer some of the, you know, but it's not fair kind of it's, questions yeah, that people right. He says, you know, God has... He made some for this purpose and some for that purpose. He's got the right 
He gives mercy on whom he wants to. He's got the right to set these things up however he wants to. Exactly. Uh, so that we have to be so careful right. about, you know, trying to pretend like we can understand all of that. Well, we, we have to uh, define terms like respecter of persons. Kind of like the word racism. Uh, you can, you can look, it depends on what you mean by what you're dealing with. Now, the idea of God not being a respecter of persons is talking about being a righteous judge. God judges righteously. Uh, you cannot bribe God. Now, a judge who, is, uh, who accepts bribes is what's called a respecter of persons. That is, if you pay me some money under the table, I will give you a decision whether it's right or not. But God judges according to righteousness, which means there are people who are good and people who are bad. And God makes that decision. And it's a just and righteous decision. He respects one and condemns the other. So you could say he's a respecter of persons. But that's a distortion of the whole idea of being a respecter of persons. Even as a lot of things are called racism that are not racism. But that's just somebody is depreciating the usefulness of that word. You can abuse a good word that helps them understand things by making it apply to things that it's not talking about. Yes, sir? I think that when he has no respect of person in a sense too, it's like that man over there uh, is dying and God may say, okay, you can live today. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's true. And on the other hand, I might take so he's that's a matter of God's government right. the way his providence it's governs our uh -huh. it's not unjust it's not unjust and we will all say one day righteous and true are you are yeah. oh, our God and he is and to, to me God is phenomenal he's, he taught me so he rose I do what I want to do when I want to do it right. and, and that's it if he says this is what I want that's where that room, when he comes in, he has room with him. I reign on the justice, the world is unjust. I give everybody rain, I give everybody sunshine. Right. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. I want us to see that uh, the Lord, uh, I, I, I wrote this down somewhere, and I want us to see um, in the New Testament, uh, you have the idea of election the chosen ones. And this theme <coughs> runs throughout the Bible. Uh, God chose Israel and he rejected Egypt. He, he, he destroyed the livestock of Egypt and saved the livestock of Israel. Now, you remember in Revelation 7, the, the image there of the angel that... Uh, placed a mark. I don't want to get these things mixed up. Revelation 7 and, uh, and Ezekiel 9 are two parallel passages in which the angels of God make a distinction between uh, two different peoples. And in Revelation 7, he's talking about the seal. I saw, verse 2, I saw another angel ascending from the rising sun with a seal of the living God, and he called the loud voice to the four angels who had been given the power to harm earth and sea. Do not harm the earth and sea of trees until we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. Now, having been sealed, they were saved. Right? Having been sealed, they were not hurt by this judgment of God in Revelation 7. The same story is in Ezekiel chapter 9, where uh, whenever God was going to judge the, the city of Jerusalem and destroy the, the the temple that was there, uh, there were four angels prepared to, de to uh, destroy. And uh, the coming with this, the, the, the six men from the upper gate, each with a weapon in his hand. And then in verse 3, the glory of God of Israel had gone up from the cherub. And then verse 4, the Lord said to him, pass through the city. Now here's a man in clothed in linen, all right? with a riding case at his wrist. The Lord said, pass through the city, 
through Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of the men who do what? Sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. Who are they? They're like Lot. Second Peter talks about Lot. He was grieved over what was happening in Sodom. These men that are marked by the angel grieve over the sins and abominations of Jerusalem. The angels make a distinction between the two classes of people. Now, Revelation 7 calls that sealed. So, look in Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, in verse 13, we read that Christians are sealed. Um, in him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. We are sealed. How are we sealed? The word of truth, right? He, he tells us that those who hear the word of truth, those who obey the gospel, they are marked, they are sealed. Their lives are changed by the gospel. They're, they, as they repent of their sins, as they live their lives conforming to the will of Jesus Christ, they walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1 and 7. And they have fellowship with the Father and the Son. When you have fellowship with God, you are secure. Whenever the judgment of God comes upon a people or a land or the whole world, those are secure who are sealed. They are marked. Their lives identify them with their Creator, with their Lord, and with their Savior. That's why in, uh, in Isaiah, you have, when God is about uh, to save his people from evil, he first, he drops the line and the plummet. Okay? He takes a rod in Ezekiel chapter 40. He measures the city. In Isaiah, he, he drops a line and a plummet. What does that do? That judges them. Peter also says, the judgment of God begins where? In the house of God. God judges the house of God first. Why? Because when we are judged, when we are corrected, like John the Baptist did when he called on all men to repent, when we are corrected, when we are righteous and holy, then we are secure. A wall of fire is about us, the wall of God. Yes, sir. Terry, I, I wouldn't have noticed this if you hadn't been talking about it, but uh, that word in chapter 9 translated distinction, mm -hmm. uh, the same Hebrew word is used in chapter 8, verse 22, uh, with the plague of the blind. Uh, and there, in the English standard, it's translated set apart. Well, I will set apart the land of the ocean. So I, I then started you know, looking that up. That's the same word uh, for where he... Uh, set, set apart the Levites. That's right. Uh, so there's there's some obvious beautiful. There's the idea of what's our word, the New Testament for that? Sanctified. 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 Holy. You're holy when you are set apart for God's use. When you are holy, you are secure. You're not holy because he's, he's kind of done some magic and you're still in your sins and you're still living a filthy life. No, that's not how that works. There has to be a judgment and correction, a repentance, a new life, walking with Christ. And then you're holy. You walk with him. You're set apart from the world. The world looks at you and that's First, uh, second, uh, first Peter 4, uh, what is it? Then they, 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 are stra they, they think it's strange that you don't run with them with the same excess. Lucy. Yes. Because we have to continue correcting those things that are amiss in our lives. We have to continue listening and continue <laughs> repenting. That's right. And, the fear of the Lord. and that's the importance of studies like this. Because they show us the seriousness of God's judgments. And 
the seriousness that God takes our conduct. Uh, okay. Uh, verse 8. Oh, by the way, we didn't get... Uh, what happened whenever the plague went through, Pharaoh saw God did exactly what he said. He went out and he checked, just to be sure. God said through, through uh, Moses and Aaron, he said, I'm going to make a distinction between your cattle and the cattle of Israel. The cattle of Israel will not die, and yours will. And so Pharaoh said, let me check that out. And what did he find? Exactly, that's what happened. Did he repent? No. <laughs> he hardened his heart. Why? Was he not convinced? Did he not see the truth? He saw the truth. He saw the evidence. Did he believe it? Uh, that's the question. Did he believe it? What do you mean by believe? Did he believe it was true? Yes. But did he believe it in the sense of accepting it? For his own life. No, he did not. And that's a, that's a great example of how believing something is true may or may not save you if you don't submit your will to that truth. Okay, let's read verse. Yes. It's interesting in the ESV, at the end of the fourth plague, it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. At the end of the fifth plague, it just says his heart was hardened. Yes. And then on the sixth plague, the Lord. Hard is hard. I know that's been part of the discussion, but I guess most of the times I read through, I didn't even call it. See, the Lord or Pharaoh did it, but mm -hmm. it was just on this one. It was just his heart was hard and didn't yeah. attribute it to either one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it's a great point, and and of course we do live in times in which people like to give God credit for everything like that, and uh, uh, it's going to be important for us to see here at the very very beginning. This is Pharaoh's attitude that's causing this to happen. Uh, and it's that attitude that God knows and everybody else knows. Uh, it's like, I was going to say this a little bit later in the study, but uh, you correct somebody and they know you're right. And they get angry about it. And they say, you make me so mad. Okay? Now, when I was correcting them, did I make them mad? What are they really mad about? The truth. Yes, they were wrong. <laughs> of course, they were wrong. That's right. That's what the, the issue really was. Uh, we, when we see somebody acting a certain way, we can pretty well anticipate what they're going to do, can't we? And when I, when, in, in this case, the Lord had already said he knew what was going to happen, but did he make it happen? Yes and no. Yeah, he did make it happen in that he did those things that Pharaoh didn't like, and he just got mad. And the madder he got, the harder he got, even though with each play, he's knocked back down and he, he's forced, he's forced against his will to submit to the will of, of God. Uh, and yet, whenever there's relief, what does he do? Turns right around again and does the foolish thing. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a great thing. You learn so much about yourself and other people by just reading this and watch watch Pharaoh and watch the way God deals with him. Terry, just to connect those points, uh, back to what Rose was saying earlier, uh, God was allowing Pharaoh to make a choice. And that's what this is all about and showing it to the world. Uh, so you could read into that distinction. You know, the Lord made the distinction in verse 4, but he made that distinction because Pharaoh had chosen his side. Pharaoh had chosen to be hard-hearted, yeah. and all of this is happening because that in, in an alternate reality, what would have happened in the very beginning if Pharaoh said, "Sure, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll submit to that." You know, it, I think uh, it's worth thinking about that. It's worth considering that. Uh, how different this could have been if Pharaoh had been a different person. But in this case, uh, God. 
The, the very fact that God told him everything he's going to do before he did it. And then he did it. Made him even madder. And more stubborn. Although at the moment of the plague to get relief, he would say, please stop, please stop. Let's get number six, verse eight. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot. How do you say that? You say soot or soot? Yes. Say soot. Okay. Uh, Suet. I see it's spelled <laughs> ashes. Pardon? She said King James says ashes. Ashes. There you go. Ashes. All right. From the kiln or from the, the, uh, the oven. Uh, and let Moses throw them in the air. In the sight of Pharaoh. You see how that's being repeated? This is done in the sight of, of Pharaoh. It's not that somebody saw this and reported it to Pharaoh. Pharaoh saw this with his own eyes. Okay? He can't, you can't say, well, he just didn't believe people who were talking to him. No. <laughs> no. He was a first hand. He was front row seated. He was in the stadium now, and God is performing his wonders, and he's in a front row seat. And so, uh, in the sight of Pharaoh, it shall become fine dust over all the land of Egypt, and become boils breaking out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. So they took soot from the kiln, and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses threw it in the air, and it became boils breaking out in sores on man and beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Okay? So we've got Pharaoh, front row seat. Where are his magicians? <laughs> I think they're, I have an idea. They're right there too, don't you? They're right there behind him. That soot goes up in the air and it becomes soot and it comes down on everybody. Okay? It's coming down on the magicians. And everywhere that soot comes down, that dust, that fine dust comes down and touches their skin, it breaks out and boils. Uh, we used to call them carbuncles. You ever had one of those? Okay. Well, they're awful. Or a rising in, in, uh, in the Midwest, they have that pretty common, along with this. I still had a scar on my leg. Yeah. I had one right there. Uh, I remember my dad, I couldn't walk to school. My dad took me to, I think it's called the Right. Mm -hmm. my daughter. I call that my gift from Arkansas. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. My, even my still right yeah. on my leg. You, you, uh -huh. uh, they are awful. And it, you just, it, it hurts and it's hard to get relief. You, they, they form a core and you go in there and you try to dig out the core. You can't dig it out. You know, it's in the sore. It's already tender. And you, you can take two threads and you can kind of twist the threads around that little core and try to lift it out and try to do that without pulling the hair. <laughs> it gets caught up in it. Um, but they had this, not just one. They had this all over their bodies. They were miserable. Okay? You can be sure of that. Now, yes? But this is the thing that when it did, here's Moses now with not one ball on him. Yeah, imagine that. And, and, There's and, Moses and Aaron, and, 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 and they, they've got and, skin and, like babies, and, newborn babies. And, and here's the magicians, the ones who did the same thing he did and all that. Yeah. But they're looking at him, and they got it all over them. They got it all over themselves. They couldn't cure themselves. Yeah. That was the thing. They could, they not, could not cure, cure themselves. themselves. Good point. Okay. Who? Uh, yes? Well, I, I think one thing, too, is this, I think, helps us get a little bit of perspective, too, about uh, something you alluded to early on in the study is the, the matter of time that takes place. Because a lot of times when we just read it straight through, we think, wow, Egypt had a really bad two weeks, mm -hmm. and then the Lord lets them go. You know, what it says it affected man and beast. Well, the previous plague, 
you know, pretty well exterminated the beast, at least if, if we take it at face value at all. Yeah. Um, that at some point here, maybe Israel is capitalizing and able to sell some of their beast. Egypt mm -hmm. is trading with other nations. Mm -hmm. You know, after these things are happening to kind of rebuild, and so now they've got some animals back in, and now Moses is struck, up, you know, God has struck them with, mm -hmm. you know, the boils that is that there's there's some time that's taking there's got place. To be, yes, there's yeah. got to be some time that's yeah. passing. Yeah, it's yeah. not like they woke up yeah. from the uh, livestock dying right. and three days later. The next day, no, no play. No, I think you're probably right about that. We're we're not really told. Uh, we're not given calendar dates for any of this, and well, you know these you things have, take time to unfold. You, you know, there's got to be some time in there because there's a lot when they went out when he. Pharaoh goes to chase after him. He's got chariots and he's got animals. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. right. Well, here again, I, I think that, that in each case, there is a context. And like you said, there may have been a time to re replenish some of those as we went along. But I, I don't think the point is that in each case it was absolute all that were being exterminated. It, there were, uh, it was a significant uh, number of what they had. Uh, but in any case, uh, we know that they had surviving or else they had had to replenish animals in order for them to have, a, have them die in later plagues. Uh, they had, uh, Egyptians were an extremely clean people, uh, bathing every day. Our time is gone, then. Okay. Um, remember that later on, God tells Israel, if they will obey his laws, that none of the diseases of Egypt would come upon them. Remember that? Egypt, for all of their medical practices and all their magicians, suffered from a lot of terrible <coughs> diseases, and they would be acquainted with the boils. They'd be acquainted with that. Uh, I've always thought that's related to a river culture anyway. I was living near the Mississippi when I got my horizon. Uh, I've never had one since. But uh, the, the fact is, for all of their scientific and medical knowledge, not only they, but their gods and goddesses. Do you know who the goddess was of, of healing? Can you imagine? Because you've heard of her. I know you've heard of her. It was Isis. The famous Isis. Where was Isis where all these boys were coming from? Where was she to protect them from this outbreak of boils that was caused by this foreign god of the Israelites? Of course, it wasn't a foreign god, was it? It was the king of kings and lord of lords. Okay. 